If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, <laughs> we do our intro for about 40 minutes. We start off by talking about people who work with Mind Pump who don't even listen to our show. What the fuck? What's wrong with you, Taylor? <laughs> Yeah. What is wrong? We'll with just you? keep making fun of you too. If yeah. you hear this message, you're fired. We're going to stop paying you. So until you figure it out, <laughs> <laughs> we also talk about creating better habits when traveling. We tend to not sleep that much and don't eat as good as we typically do. Yeah. So we're, we're going to really try. live in the brand. I think. You know I mean? Yeah, I think I'm going to be the asshole on the trip. We'll see what happens. Yeah, you, you like doing that more of the asshole uh, as we yeah. say what's gonna be yeah different? i was like what's <laughs> different? Yeah, yeah. 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 well we're both asshole, assholes in different ways <laughs> true we talk about the value of hormone testing um we are working with a at-home hormone testing company you can actually order these tests and find out if your hormones are within normal range highly recommended especially for somebody who's struggling with fat loss or muscle building sometimes it's uh, there's something wrong with your hormones or something off the company is Everly Well. If you go to Everly, E-V-E-R-L-Y, well.com and enter the code MINDPUMP, you're going to get a massive 15% off. We also talked about our talk at Vince Del Monte's Mastermind and how we connected with other entrepreneurs. Uh, we also mentioned Viore Clothing again in this episode. If you go to Viore Love Clothing. my Viore fits. V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash mind pup. You get 25% off. Uh, we are, oh, by the way, we're on another tour or another trip coming up soon. So when you listen to this episode, there's a couple days left to sign up for this. If it's not already full, get your name on there. You have to go to, and you have to type in the www in the beginning for some strange reason www.mindpumpmedia.com forward slash tour. This is the last call for the Seattle event. We also did a wrap up of our Mother's Day weekend. Oh, Mom, we love you. Thanks, Mommy. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, what are some of the best life skills we have learned from our moms? Uh, I know I learned a lot from Justin's mom. Next question. <laughs> 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 What a good one today. Next question was, oh, oh, wow. Just open up a cancer. Can we explain the benefits of the Romanian deadlift over the conventional deadlift and why we included mm. it in Maps Black? Yeah. The next question was, what are some positives for competing in bodybuilding? We always talk about the negatives, but what are the positives aside from the Speedo? I consider that a positive. There's a lots positive? of positives. Yeah, mm. there's there's a lot of positives in there. Oiling up. That's a good That's one. That's one of my favorites. And finally, uh, what are some good ways that you can break through plateaus in strength and size? So if your body stops progressing, you're not getting stronger, you're not building any more muscle, what are some techniques you can apply to your routine, to your nutrition that will get your body to respond Again, also this month, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, the Intermittent Fasting Guide, you get those for free if you enroll in any bundle. Now, bundles are where we take multiple MAPS programs, put them together, and discount them by 20 or 30% off. For example, the Super Bundle, which is a year of exercise program. But you can also enroll in our MAPS programs individually. For example, if your goal is maximum muscle and strength, MAPS Anabolic is the program for you. If your goal is to sculpt and shape your body like a bodybuilder, a physique competitor, or a bikini competitor, well, that's MAPS Aesthetic. If your goal is functional movement and athletic performance, well, that's MAPS Performance. And if you like to work out at home or on the road with minimal to no equipment, that's MAPS Anywhere. And finally, the correctional programs that we offer, the programs that help you correct imbalances, alleviate pain, and just learn how to move better, that's MAPS Prime and Prime Pro. And if you're a personal trainer especially, you will benefit from getting those programs so you can apply what you learn in them to train your clients and separate yourself from your peers. For more information on all of that, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. My boy with the the swaggy uh, the swaggy sneakers over oh, he's here all today. Out. I know, yeah, I know. Oh What's yeah, going on, man? sponsored by Nike. You know what? I heard. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> Who? Yeah. Yeah. Who is? Well, it's it's not so much a sponsorship. It's them it's just helping uh, promote us. I don't know if you've seen on my Instagram. I was mm -hmm. in the Nike store. I, I did a big picture of me and 
my favourite clothes from Nike and all that, and they just give me loads of gear. What uh, so led to that? Uh, one of the VPs of Nike was training in the gym with Glenn, you know, you know Glenn, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, he built a relationship with them, and then he was bringing loads of people in, and they love box and burn gyms in Santa Monica, and the next thing you know, it's like, do you want to get involved with this Metcon Monday, you know, the Metcon shoes, yeah. mm-hmm. a promotion with that, so oh, definitely 100%, and then next thing, do you want to start selling merch? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to start selling Nike merch? Yes. <laughs> and box and burn on. So that's it, and we, we still have the start of the relationship but it's it's building it's getting bigger and bigger but it's just so good for the brand oh for oh, sure. you me to yeah. partner with a brand that's like massive. nike oh, that's yeah. fucking right so now do you carry now apparel nike apparel inside your facility yet? yeah nike slash box and burn so we've got hoodie i'll have to get you some next time you come down on next week yeah uh, but yeah we've got the nike stuff in there it's great oh that's oh, so shit, cool man yeah, that's, a big deal, that's man. excellent it's now it. how's the how's the, the classes and academy stuff going how's that growing the academy's going really really well you know we we the only ones that's really doing it, but we're doing it right. We're, we're doing it right, you know. We, ah, well, I'm spending so much of my time now, not so much concentrating on the gyms, but concentrating on the Boxing Burn Academy. This is our education program where we teach trainers how to teach boxing to other people. You know, I think boxing is one of the biggest trends in fitness right now. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to box, but the only problem is not everyone knows how to teach boxing, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where we come in. You know? it, what I see with what I see with it is the same problem I see with a lot of things in the fitness industry, which is. People treat it as a way just to get sweaty and, and, and get sore. So they'll go in and they'll want to lift weights or they'll want to run. They don't know how to run. They don't know how to lift weights. Yeah. But their idea of a good workout is, oh, I got sore and I sweat a lot. And that's what a lot of these boxing, not your classes, but other boxing classes I've seen is people are terrible technique. They're not learning how to throw punches properly. It's just swing your arms and get really sweaty. What separates yours from the ones I've seen at least is you're teaching boxing yeah. and you're teaching trainers how to teach boxing not just to make people sweat you yeah. know what i mean that's a big difference the, the real fundamentals of boxing and you know if you're a trainer and you're teaching boxing yeah you might get someone a good workout but if someone asks you when i move to me left which foot do i move first and you're a trainer and you don't know the answer to that question right. you look like a bit of a dick right you, you do. <laughs> uh, yeah but we we teach them all of that stuff it's like i'm not uh big on strength work and i wouldn't try and teach one of my clients how to do like a, a turkish get up or something like that right so right. i would if they said what weight should I use? Mm. Why does it hurt my back? What? I wouldn't have a clue, you know, and I would look like a bit of a dick. Right. So mm. unless you get trained in something like that or like boxing, uh, that's you, you want to really stand out from the crowd and stand out from all of the other people in the industry. That's, right. that's a very specific skill. And I think that, yeah, people don't uh, realize that until they go into one of your kinds of classes where you guys really break it down and get all the fundamentals yeah. there in place. Yeah, we'll break it down in, into the fine fine detail teaching the trainers because it is very important that the, t- the trainer knows what the hell he's talking about when he's teaching boxing. Right. You know? So, uh, so when's the next, we have one coming up here at, at Mind Pump Media and then you have some other ones. When are the next ones people can sign up for? Yeah, San Jose, in, in this beautiful gym that's June 10th then we'll be in Sydney, Australia I know you've got a great following in Sydney in Australia uh, that's July 6th and 7th we're going to level one. 1 and level 2 <laughs> yeah <laughs> right now take, the one in San Jose is that level 1, level 2 that's level 1 it's level a, 1 that's a level 1 and that's where you start off and then that's in Sydney the, you said there's 1, one and 2 yeah back to back Sydney 1 and 2 oh. uh, so that's July 6th and 7th then we go into England uh, where, where obviously where I'm from that's in August as well so we we travel around. We uh, yeah, we travel around. How do people around. sign up for this? Boxandburnacademy.com on the website. We've got all the information on there. And then they sign up. And then are you, are we giving? Uh, are you giving Mind Pump listeners yes. a coupon or something? Yeah. Like that? So we've got the coupon code is Mind Pump, and that's for everything on the website. We do online courses as well with the Boxing Burn Academy. You can do a level one, level two online, and use the code Mind Pump, and you'll save a hundred dollars on any course. Hundred dollars, yeah, excellent. Yeah, and I hope, deal, man. I hope people come here to San Jose and take some of the classes here. I know it's coming up soon, on June tenth, but uh, you know, one of us may pop in, say hi, maybe. But you'll be you'll, you'll be in Mind Pump Media headquarters, yeah, where we do all of our filming and stuff like that. And last time you guys were here, you had about twenty. Five, maybe 30 people. Yeah, it was packed. It was great. And I had uh, incredible reviews because afterwards people, mm-hmm. you know, were DMing me and were saying it was phenomenal. Um, and that there were a couple people who are trainers, who've been trainers for a while, who say that they've been able to use it with their clients. And, and that's just it. If you're a trainer and you want to separate yourself from, from your peers, part of the way you separate yourself is 
uh, your the 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 breadth of skills that you have. Well, level up your education. That's right? it. I mean, that's and and I feel like in training right now, there's a ton of ways to do that through like basic training. But there's not a. I mean, you guys are the first ones to do this. I feel like with the certification for actual teaching boxing for teaching clients. I would. I wish this was around when I was training because yeah. I was that asshole. I was. The, <laughs> yeah. I was. I was one hundred percent one of those assholes who I had so many clients that wanted me to t- teach boxing. Like I just was YouTubing it and trying to learn and like holding pads and had some people teach me. But just I wasn't even good at doing that. And if there was a certification out there, because your guys' certification too, it, doesn't it count as CEUs for other certifications too? Yeah. So you get CEUs for NASAM, ES, ISSE, EFEE. So you get CEUs for that. So the continued education units, which is massive as well. That's what makes oh, it a no-brainer to me. Go. It's like if, as a trainer, you already have to do these continuing education Just to units, keep your cert. anyways. Yeah. So why not add different tools to your tool belt like this? So I think it's brilliant. I'm looking forward to having you guys back in here. We always love you stopping by yep. here, Tony. Yeah, good people. So boxingburnacademy.com. The code is Mind Pump. It takes a hundred dollars off every single course. The first one, San Jose, June 10th. That's level one. Then there's Sydney, Australia. July 6th and 7th, that's level 1 and 2. Do it. T-shirt time! All right, we have 15 reviews. We're giving out four shirts. We've got Mitchell James, Maria Maya 22, Gina Gutierrez, Jay Biscuit. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. What's a whisker biscuit? I don't know. Sounds delicious. Dude, I'm telling you right now, these these new... Uh, bro, they're the business. These new sweats from uh, from Viore. We're not even supposed to do a commercial right now, but I'm going to be honest with you. It feels like these are made with baby skin. <laughs> with baby skin? <laughs> yeah. I don't know we want to put that in the market. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not real baby skin. Okay. But it feels like baby skin. It feels like, maybe like baby seals. Yeah. Like you know? rabbit's fur. Like, uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're just using That's a bunch vel- of- <laughs> We're using a bunch of like like things that people would hate, you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> made That's with real piss you off. baby seal skin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Baby panda fur. <laughs> How no, but a, it's really soft. How good of a job did our boy Taylor do this this last trip? I'm really, really proud. It's not bad, not bad. I feel like he's uh, he's halfway there. <laughs> yeah, he's on the rise. <laughs> he, you know what? what sucks. He barely yeah. ever listens to the show, so I can't make fun of him. I know, I know. Expecting him to hear it. You know what Anytime I mean? Katrina sees him, she tells him. She's like, "Do you listen to the show at all?" And he's like, <laughs> uh, "I try to when I can. This and that." She's like, "You don't, do you?" He's like, "Yeah, honestly, it's been a while." The time. day that he starts listening is the day I know, like, "Oh shit, we're fucking, yeah, <laughs> we're killing it now." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. We've, we've yeah. we went our own on that level. We went our own employees over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. We just got to the family. Now, you know, we got to get our employees. You know what, though? I just did an interview and somebody was asking about that, about all the other people that work for us. And, you know, I think it it sounds probably crazy. I don't think I don't know too many uh, businesses that hire people that don't like as far as other podcasts. Right. Mm -hmm. When we meet other podcasters and their staff of people, they're all like raving fans. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't get that with ours. I mean, look at Casey, Brett. I mean, you have Anne and Brianna that do, but I mean, as far as uh, Drew, Taylor, Mm-mm. I mean, they don't even really listen to this show. You know what? I see benefits to both, right? Yeah. I see benefits to to fans working for you because then they really know, you know, the style of the show. Yeah. They know what you're talking What's about. Sort of on brand with what you guys talk about. Yeah. But then I also see the benefits of having someone come on that's outside of it because it's a new pair of eyes. And, and let's be honest, Taylor and Drew- that's their job. Part of their job is to be outside of our space and right. to make us look and say, or, or feel different than the typical fitness brand. Plus, they're younger than us. You know, like it, that's a, a huge advantage for us because we don't think the same way. Yeah. You know, like there's things that they consider or like what's hot or what's new uh, coming out that people are really getting into. And it's like, we're not doing that kind of research. Well, in our space, it's really common to like, Everyone does the same thing. That's what I mean. It's yeah. the same, it's like same the, old, same it's, old. It's like the same formula. And it's it's proven, so I get it. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? So, you know, I know that that works. It works to do that. But, I mean, again, that's where I want, I want to be different. And I love that they're like that, too. That they, they look at the space and they go, instead of looking at, like, oh, this company's doing really good, let's mm-hmm. mock, like, which is what they teach you in business. I mean, they tell you, like, find a company that's doing what you're doing and doing it really well and find the things that they do really well and model after it. And a lot of what Mind Pump continues to do is 
to do stuff that others aren't doing in our space. Yeah, try and well, I think what what they're doing is they're looking at other brands that are not in fitness that do really well. Yeah, and in deriving inspiration from from those types of brands, which none of us would really, I guess, know how to do, or we'd have to spend a lot more energy on in order to even come close. It's us outside of our bubble. Yeah, you know, yeah. we're sort of in a bubble, even though it feels like a big bubble. It's just like everybody's sort of big it's like old a, bubble. <laughs> this bubble's about to bust. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Dude, how t- were you guys tired? I was exhausted the last. I'm still tired, bro. Yeah. Dude, I last night we uh, should have done this when we were twenty. I was. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like we fucked up, dude. Oh man, I'm too old for this. I mean, yeah. I don't even like really Back talking about it on air. But I was telling Katrina yesterday, I was just like, I'm just exhausted. It's only fucking San Diego. You know what I'm saying? It's not like we came you know, from you Europe. Know, you know <laughs> yeah. what it is, dude? Like, like why? You know what it is? It's because when we do these things, the we're, amount of energy. We're all in. Yeah, the amount of energy we're put, and it's our. It was our first event, and all of us were super excited. So that's a lot of energy. We're trying to do our best. Then we don't get we don't go to bed on time. I no. tried one night by going to bed early, and you fuck sticks were out in the in the in the jacuzzi, <laughs> you know, having a party. Yeah. And you know what? It's hard. It is hard for us to like because you're just go go go. And so then we come back, and then the best part is they come back, and then kids are here, school. Yeah. You know, got to do laundry, got to do this, that. Right. Oh man, it's you got to catch up. Yeah. It's tough, man. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it is I feel like such a bitch saying that too right now because people are listening, going like, "Fuck you guys!" Like you talk on a goddamn. <laughs> like, you know what I'm <laughs> like I don't even like talking about it uh, on here, but it's true. true. Like I was so exhausted. Like it's we, true, we are pussies. We uh, passed out last night at nine o'clock, or I did. Katrina, did you really? Yeah, Katrina. We were getting, we we're going upstairs to watch the Karate Kid thing. So I downloaded oh, the sweet. YouTube Red because Justin was ranting and raving about it. So. I was like, you know what? Let's let's go in our room and we'll just we'll throw it on the laptop and we can. I want to watch that so bad. Relax, right? So we went upstairs and I think we watched the first episode together. Then she went down to let the boys out to go to the bathroom at like nine, and by the time she got back upstairs, I was like out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's yeah. like, dude, you were so out. I was like, so tired. Mm. And that's the second day. Yesterday, I was exhausted. Well, too, what man. I'm starting to realize is with these with the stuff that we're doing and how when we do this we sprint really hard yeah. is it's more important to do everything that we can to, to maintain ourselves so that we can perform really well because what I don't want to do and is you know push on all cylinders and then don't 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 do all the things that we know that can help us, you know, maintain that and then crash and burn or get sick. Or just not perform, you know, well, to our best the ability. Idea is we're a we're a health and fitness podcast, yeah. so we've we've got to be able to find that balance. And I, it's I hard. Think, it's, I thought, it is hard, but I think we're, we're better. I think we do a really good job. Like mm-hmm. I think that we. I don't think we're great yet. I think we're better. I think we're a lot better. I think our food choices are getting better. We're not staying up quite as late. The last two trips, I felt like I've ate great. Like mm-hmm. I've had I've. Compared to what we were when we first started, like we would use a trip as like a, ah, let's re- just yeah. totally nothing. You know, we're gonna just eat, yeah. What, yeah, eat whatever, <laughs> eat whatever Gummy we bears. feel like it for a day or two, just because we're on it all all the time. But th- it's now I've realized how mo- how important it is that we're dialed even more so while we're gone, just because, so you can perform and, yeah. and be well. I think I, we've I, been looking for gyms and getting our exercising in a bit more when we travel. That was something that like you know we'd get a little more infrequently, but we're really pursuing it now. I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, that obviously could be something we could schedule a bit better. But it's like, you know, like we we're there to to do a specific, you know, objective. You know what it is? It's and this is a good learning experience. For for all of us, I think, because when we're on these uh, these trips and we're doing these events and podcasts and we're interviewing people, we're in that space. We're in that like, this is what we're doing type of space. And it's hard to remove yourself from that space to mm-hmm. get a workout in or instead of buying food somewhere, going to the grocery store, getting something that's maybe healthier, you know, going to bed early because you're in that, that space and you don't want to leave that space because it feels exciting exhilarating and it's just it's hard it is very hard to go to sleep when we do you know when we podcast or do these events and then we're in the same house together Mm -hmm. and all we want to do is maintain that that energy and keep it up but the way i'm looking at it is i'm looking at it like uh you know like a i guess like a coach like okay here's the deal like here's the deal if you're and you guys, I'm going to use a sports analogy. So you Here guys- we go. Oh, God. <laughs> I just put my seatbelt on. <laughs> yeah. Think about it this way. When you're playing in the best of the best, when you're playing in the NBA or the NFL, and you're playing other talented players, other people with great genetics, you're playing other 
individuals who also work hard, who do what it takes, then sometimes the difference between you and them is the difference is, you know, the players that get the weekly, get the massages, get the mm-hmm. acupuncture, go to bed, do the cryotherapy. You're talking about what LeBron James does. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And so the way I'm starting to look at it in my mind is I'm starting to process this and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm normally, I mean, yes, we do a lot of things good, but I want to try and make it perfect and just be perfect. Like do Dominate. everything. Yes. Because yeah. that, you know what, that's, that'll be our advantage. I don't think anybody can, can keep up with us on all the other stuff plus throw that on top of it. I think we'll be unstoppable. Mm-hmm. So I think it'll be something that we're starting to get into more of a rhythm. No, I could see, it. I, could in, see you know? it. I already noticed a difference just in like hormonally, like feeling better. Finally, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I can, Oh yeah. T- you're, you're a different person. Yeah. That's no, straight up. No, I can, I can feel that coming out of that, you know, the last six months was really tough. So man, imagine what's going through me as we're doing all this stuff, like, and then also feeling the dip in that, like I can already feel my, energy coming back up because my hormones are coming back up. So. Oh, because what I want to do is I want to go, because now we're going to be leaving for uh, LA and Seattle, right? Mm-hmm. So we came back three, two or three days, three days here, boom, right back on, and events, like two this time. What I'm going to try and do is I want to like, at a particular time at night, I'm going to you know meditate and I'm going to go try to go to sleep, as, how hard, however hard it can be. Wake up at a specific time, I'm going to set my alarm. Because here's the other thing that I noticed that kind of you know, messes me up a little bit is um, if I wake up at different times, and I think Check might even talked about this. He said to wake up at the same time every morning, regardless, and try to go to bed at the same time because that's how your, your body gets in a rhythm. And w- even though you may still be getting eight hours or seven hours of sleep, if you normally go to bed at 10, but now you're going to bed at midnight and you think, oh, I'm going to wake up at seven or eight instead, that may not be as good. So what I'm going to try and do set my alarm for 5.30 or 6 a.m., and go to bed, you know, or, or, or at least try to get close to that because it might not be possible, right? Because we might be, you know, somewhere for a long time or whatever and yeah. see how big. But as far as it, the, you mentioned your testosterone levels, uh, Adam, you still haven't tested. No, I haven't. I've been kind of just basing it off feel. Yeah, I've been waiting till like, because I mean, it's was pretty obvious about three months ago and beyond, you know, or further back that. You know, it wasn't there. <laughs> you know, saying it's very, it's very, very obvious to me when it's not. Like now, I'm more on the like, okay, am I like, am I back to normal? Am I getting back to normal? How close am I like to, you know, where I was before? I mean, it, it's been years since I have gone uh, this long with not even the therapeutic dose of testosterone. So this is the longest in the last four years that I've gone, or five years even at that that I've gone with, you know, no testosterone whatsoever. We're already coming up. I'm already coming up on like eight months or wow, something. Wow, that's like great. That. So, so I, what I was going to say to you is, because um, there's, there's a couple of theories that I have, because you, you you look way different. You're talking talk about how, you, how great you feel. So your testosterone levels are definitely higher than they were, but it'll be interesting to see if they're in a good range or if they're just higher and you have so many more receptors now that are open because you were so low for so long. You know what I'm saying? Because I think when you go off testosterone for a while and your testosterone dips, I think your receptors upregulate the same way that they downregulate when you have too much testosterone. Mm-hmm. So I want to see what's going on there. And we Taylor set something up with uh, Everly Well. Are you guys familiar with Everly Well? We yeah. met him at Paleo. Paleo effects. Oh, that's yeah, that's right. right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Like I, don't know, I don't know much ab- about them. I know that they do you know, several different tests. They do I, at mm-hmm. home uh, hormone tests. They have specific ones. So you could do testosterone. You mm-hmm. could do... I did a food sensitivity. I grabbed that uh, test. I haven't done it yet. But, yep. You could yeah. test yourself for... I believe they test for IgG antibodies, which can point you in the right direction in terms of food intolerances. So, you know, the the, the elimination diet is still the gold standard, but a lot of times people are like, well, where do I start? Mm-hmm. And these tests can help point the right direction because you can see what food... Now I've heard people I've heard people knock some of these at home tests. I saw this one on Shark Tank way back when when they first came out, and I've heard good things about it. But I don't. I haven't personally like investigated like the accuracy of it. Is it? it you know what I think of because I've heard some people like hate on them, mm-hmm. but then I've I've also heard from now I've heard from people that are connected to them about how accurate it actually is, and it reminds me kind of like comparing. You know, um, you know, body skin fold versus the dunk tank versus you know, and, and we get Bot into this pod and all these. Yeah. Right? Is it is it one of those things where it's like it's more about the you know getting it done and then following up and seeing seeing it again, like it's just to see the change, or should you know, it be really accurate to where I'm at? So two things. So when it comes to hormones, <laughs> saliva tests are uh, pretty 
damn accurate. The from what I've read, the problem with saliva tests is I think they're harder to administer because when you go to if you're in a lab, you have to spit in a vial and it takes a little while to fill up a vial with or a few vials with spit. So I think that may be part of the problem. I think um, first thing in the morning, no food. I think is important. Um, the the food intolerance tests. There's a lot of controversy surrounding those because they're not foolproof, <clears throat> and there's still controversy as to whether or not food intolerances exist in Western medicine. Well, still, there's still mm. you get a lot of people saying they don't really exist. So, but no, Everly Will Everly Wells, you know, products are are legit. Like you, you know, it's going to tell you if you're low or if you're normal. And the way I suggest you use them is you take one test and then wait a few months, make your changes, and then take another one. <laughs> Just like with a body fat test, make sure it's done at the same time, you know, same circumstances. That's how I was going to use it. Like yeah. I was going to use it the exact same way, no matter how accurate they tell me it is, because I think that's what happens a lot. For me, I know all of this stuff could literally change per week. You know what I'm saying? Like if you... If you're doing, if you're sleeping really well, your diet's dialed, you're training really well, you take one of these tests, and then three weeks later, you know, you go to take it to the test again, but that just happens to fall in the week where you miss sleep, you're stressed, work is fucking, you lost your job, stressed out, you missed workouts all that week. Like I'm sure you're going to see a, a difference. I mean, I'm sure you're going to see a significant difference in in the test. So I think it's important that 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 that's how you're using tests like this. Is okay. You know, it's not the end all be all, but it's a great way for me to measure and see if the things that I'm implementing into my life is actually having a positive effect on like my hormone level. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to take it. I feel like it's about time for me. No, to and, and the way you're going to the way you're using it is exactly the <clears throat> it's the best way to use saliva test is to use it as a gauge and to track yourself. And if you if you really want to get you know down to it, you can do so, several throughout the day. So you could test some in the morning, afternoon, evening. And here's the thing. It's like when we had, uh, what's his, what's his name, the, the carnivore diet? Sean. Sean Baker. Sean, Sean Baker. When he came on the show, <clears throat> he was pointing out how cholesterol tests can be so crazy from, from during the day. Like you could test it in the mm -hmm. morning, test it at night. After a workout, it'll be way lower. If you fast, your cholesterol goes up temporarily during the fast. And so he pointed out how multiple tests are probably the best way to go. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is, do the testosterone test once, test it again, maybe a couple weeks later, same time, and then you can start having fun with it and see what's going on. But these are these are cool because they're at home. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Anybody could do that at home and and, and, and you've already it. done it. I have one now, so I'm just waiting to take it. So I'll, I'll get on it and take it now. I think it's a good time. Probably when we get back from this trip that's coming up because we got mirror. Or I mean, uh, doses first, and then we got mirror. And then, I, then we're back home for a little I'm going to do another one. Just Thank God see. it's not a drug test. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Bro, we did. How funny was it uh, the other day when we did uh, we did the talk at the, was it Vin, uh, Vince's um, Mastermind? Oh, Vince Del Monte. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Vinny! Yeah. What was the nickname? Skinny Vinny, he said? Yeah, when he skinny yeah, Vinny. Yeah. When we did, we did a talk at his Mastermind group, and we're up there holding our copper... You know, Moscow mule cups while we're talking <laughs> to everybody about podcasting. Hey, we got to loosen it up a little bit in there. It's kind of stuffy. Somebody took a picture and, and posted it on Instagram. They're like, This is the first time I've ever had a speaker, uh, I've ever seen a speaker drink. While they were <laughs> <laughs> well, leave it to my ah, We like to be the first. <laughs> we're like a, lot, the, a lot of directions. We're like the wild card or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that was a good time. It was it a was really good, good time. Man. Shout out to anybody that's listening to the show that we that we got a chance to talk. And because when we went into Vince's talk, I have to be honest that I wasn't sure how many people were would already be on to podcasting or even interested in it, much less have already been listening to Mind Pump. And when I got up there and first started, I was like, okay, well, how many of you guys even listen to a podcast? And like the whole fucking room raised their hand. So I thought that was surprising. Mm -hmm. And then I said, how many of you guys listen to Mind Pump? And half the room kept their hands up. So I thought, oh, wow, okay, this is cool. This is our people we get to talk to then. And these guys are all like, guys and girls are all killers. They're it's a seven figure mastermind group. So most of the people in here are making a few hundred they're thousand. Doing well. Yeah, they're already they're already killing the game. They're just trying to make it to the to the next level and get into seven figures. So really cool audience to talk to. Mm -hmm. I see I'm seeing the the a lot of these a lot of uh these groups now are starting to pop up, these mastermind groups. They've been around for a while where people get coached by mm -hmm. I think they've been around for a really long time, but I think that in and I think a great interview that talks about this is when we interviewed Lewis Howes and how he built his first off of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, listening to that story and when 
LinkedIn and uh, you know Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these all these social media platforms kept, were created and it gave us the ability to connect to people all over the world like intimately like that. Mm-hmm. I think it made it a, a really easy transition or pivot from there to create these mastermind type groups. So mm-hmm. I, I think it just made it easier. Like before you'd have to have a book out there or you'd have to already mm-hmm. be on TV or radio and be kind of really well known yeah. before you could, you know, go to a city or go somewhere and say, Hey, you know, pay me X amount of dollars and we'll all get together and I'm going to teach you how to do what I've done. Where now we have this, I mean, even like us going down to Viore, you know, we didn't, when Taylor first set this all up, like, I don't, you know, I don't know how many like diehard mind pump fans are in San Diego. Like, I don't know how many people are going to on a Thursday night roll out to come see us. Like, I really didn't know. It's not like we aggressively promoted it or anything like that. So that was really interesting to see um, the show. So that's, I mean, and easily we could turn that into mm. mastermind. One groups. thing that I, I got from it is <clears throat> how much I enjoy uh, talking to you guys with an audience. Because mm-hmm. you get that feedback. Like right now, recording the podcast, I feel like would be more awesome if there was like five or 10 people. Yeah. that We're not talking to them or anything like that, but we're just doing our show, but there's people in the background and then you can read them and I don't know, I feel like it, it's almost like a studio audience yeah. when you're- you know, it, was, that, it was the first time it actually felt like what we've kind of done on the podcast, like mm-hmm. live. And I think that uh, the interaction with the audience- was natural to where they're asking good questions, but it just fueled our conversation instead mm-hmm. of it just being like a lecture, which was was great. I was I loved that it was different. Yeah, you know? I, I'm really thinking you know hard about how awesome that would be to every <laughs> once in a while have you know, I mean, and that'll be down in the future. Nothing now. I'm, but I'm have an audience. You know? I'm stoked about where where we're going to be or what we're going to be doing with Mir up in Seattle this coming week. Like, or Wednesday. This goes live when Doug tomorrow. So we still have a couple of days before that. And there, and I know it's a, a much bigger venue. So there's room for people. If you're just now listening to this, that we head up to mirror and this one's, this will be the last one of all. Now this one, we're actually interviewing someone first, right? Yes. Yeah, the so, owner of the, the founder of mirror. That's right. In fact, that's, that's what we have this morning, Doug. We have a call with him this morning to follow up. I don't know if you remember that or not. Make sure we were, we check on the time on that. But yeah, we, we talked to him first and then we'll still do, it'll be very similar to Viore. The only difference than than Viore is that we will open up with a, kind of an intro to Mir and why mind pump and Mir and things like that, and then we'll transition into our Q and A with our audience. Mm-hmm. But it's gonna be a it's gonna be a good time. I'm I'm excited. I'm super excited. I, I'm really excited super because pumped. Viore. I felt like everybody needed to get that out of their system just so they could kind of feel what it was gonna be like. Now that we see what it's gonna be like, I think it's gonna be really exciting because before a lot of these the seminars, the meetings, the things we go to, it was like a split of some listeners, some, some not Mm -hmm. where, you know, we're finding out at the, the tour, these are all like, I can't wait till we've done, you know, 50 of these, you know, cause we know what happened when we, when we started podcasting, however fun it was and however good we thought we were when we started right around a hundred episodes or so, there was like this, Uh, you get in the groove, this shift, right. And And how good we got. And you can actually clearly listen. If you listen to our podcast, you can clearly see there was a change Right around 100 or 150 where really we really got a, just a lot better, just like anything that you do a lot. Same thing with YouTube. Like we started off and, you know, we do our thing and, and now we're starting to feel like we're really getting into our groove and it's morphing into its own style. I can't wait till we've done, you know, 10, 20, 30 of these where it really starts to turn into its own thing and, and, and then it really gets fucking fun. It's like learning how to play the piano, like... You know, even if you really enjoy learning, you're not making music until later on. Then when you really know what you're, you know, when you're really getting comfortable with playing this instrument, it's a, even if you enjoyed it in the beginning, it's, there's nothing like making music. And I can't wait until, you know, we get to that point. You know what I mean? I feel like it's going to be, I feel like it's going to be just another flow state for us, another awesome thing. And I'm really excited about that because well, I have yet to, <clears throat> not, I have yet to not like anything we do. Everything we do is, has been so rewarding. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, no, I I really really enjoy the connecting with people. I mean, I was the after part. Yeah, when awesome. we when we spent some time with people talking to them afterwards, I I said, you know, this is the piece of the business that I have to be honest. Like, it's we're over three years in now, and we're finally getting to the stuff that I really that really excites me. I really get excited to talking to other entrepreneurs, other people trying to build their business, and I really like 
connecting one-on-one with people. And it's funny because, and I was sharing this with some of the people that I got a chance to talk to, you know, when we've met our peers in the podcasting space, a lot of them are, you know, very talented and brilliant, but a lot of them actually like prefer the at your house and on the podcast, like, you know, in their space where they get their computer in front of them. And that's kind of like how they like to do things where I, that shit is, that scares me. Like, I don't fucking know how to turn on our computer. Like if it wasn't for Doug, like (laughs) we wouldn't be able to do this. Like I like put me in front of people, put me in front of somebody that I can talk. I can look you in the eyes and I can connect with you. That to me is, is more natural and I enjoy it even more. It's actually taken a lot of work to do what we do right now on these mics where we're, you know, talking to, tons of people but it doesn't feel like it because i can't see them and Mm. you've made a point about why and it's so important i think when we're up there talking i'm looking at people in the audience and and you can see the feedback if you're striking a chord and you can see a feedback if you're not you know if you're looking at an audience and they're chattering to each other or they're looking off or they're looking at their watch like (laughs) you're not on it you know what i'm saying after we did that uh that event i you know we came home and uh, i was just up till i don't know 1 30 thinking about the whole thing and and you know when you start to experience this, experience these different modalities or these different ways of presenting yourself or what we're trying to communicate you you have there's always a learning curve and so I was just studying it and I've also been studying effective speakers people who speak in front of large audiences to see you know because that's a skill besides the fear aspect and the anxiety aspect and the, oh I don't like talking to a lot of people that's definitely a hurdle. Once you get past that, though, there's the how can I be effective? How can I get people to engage? Mm-hmm. And one of the things is, you know, you're not talking to a group. You're talking to a lot of individuals. And so you look at individuals and don't be afraid to ask them questions or to point or to nod or to, you know, to really to address the individuals in the audience. And that also simultaneously... I've discovered makes it more comfortable yeah. when you start doing that. It's effective communicating, but it's also, Oh, I feel more comfortable now because I'm talking to this guy in the front or that girl in the back over there. Well, it's inclusive as well. Yeah. It's not, you're not up on stage to just like, uh, sing and dance and, and it's all about you, you know, like and that's not really our flavor anyway. We're very inclusive. Mm-hmm. We want people, people's opinions. We want people to throw us curveballs. You know, we want that interaction and I think that's the only way to do it is to really just pull them in, draw them in one by one. Yeah, it's it was it was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. So uh, we just had Mother's Day. Yeah. What'd you guys do? Did you guys do anything? Just uh, yeah, like all kinds of stuff. My wife, I was like on a mad <laughs> dash you a honey to do like list? honey doing everything. Um, and uh, <clears throat> no, it was fun. I mean, we we went out and and had some lunch and um, uh, just spent some quality time with the kids and. I mean, everybody had just come over this sickness over the weekend when we were gone, and so um, it was pretty light. We did a little bit of hiking and just getting out and kind of, uh, you know, just just trying to to get away from a lot of distractions. Do you get stuff. Do you get your wife a gift from the kids, or from you, or both? Uh, well, what was nice was like I did kind of like a double whammy where we were at Viore and I just like scooped up a bunch of cool gear for her there. And so she was stoked on that alongside, you know, getting her some flowers and, um, just, I, for me, it's really just like taking on a lot of like house things that need to be accomplished. Yeah. She just gets a lot of, you know, joy out of that. So. Now when you're, when you're married like that, is it, is, is you have to k- take care of your mom and wifey? Is that like the deal? So Does one take I, more of a priority. Well, two moms. I, I balance that out. Sometimes I'm, I, I mean, unfortunately, my mom gets sort of the uh, lower end of the, <laughs> of the uh, attention. Uh, but this year, I actually like the the weekend before, since my mom had been like heavily doing a lot because my my aunt had died, had passed away, um, and she was taking care of my grandma. Um, the house is now like she's trying to get this house ready for market in. Uh, and my mom's the kind of person that doesn't really ask for a lot of help. She's very much like me. We're like the same person, which is why we kind of clash a lot. But I've been really trying to kind of reach out and know ahead of time and anticipate like she needs things. Right. And so, um, I actually was, uh, we, we worked it out where it was like kind of a, uh, a trip where just me and my mom, we went to go to the house and then I just, I, I mowed the lawn, I straight and organized, got a bunch of stuff out of the house for her, took it back with my truck and 
um, you know, helped her get it ready for, for market. So, mm-hmm. Uh, she really appreciated that, so that was that earned me some some equity. You know? I, I, got, I got a li- I kind of messed up a little bit. Uh oh. Yeah. Oh so, shit. Not because of my mom. I always remember my mom, so I got her you know nice card and I wrote some nice stuff in there and gift card and all that stuff, but uh, and flowers. But uh, so Jessica's mom was visiting, and you know we got her. I got her something too, and her, her mom's wonderful. By the way, I can see where Jessica gets her wisdom. Her mom is one of the most wise, calm people I've ever met just a right away you want you feel like you want to like you can open up and talk to her Jessica's got that uh, that quality as well and I totally see now where she gets it but you know they were both asking me so we get back and it's like the day before Mother's Day from our trip and that night like right before bed you know Jessica's mom's like so would you get um would you get your ex-wife I'm like what what do you mean She's like Mother's Day. What did you What did you get her for? You know, from the kids for Mother's Day. And I'm like, oh, I, I guess I should. Should I? I mean, I, <laughs> I guess I did it last year. I got her something from the kids last year. Uh, but yeah, I didn't even think about it. And then I realized, like, she's like, well, why not? Like, she's the mother of your children, and this and that. And she guys both co-parent, and she's totally, I mean, on point with it. But then I realized I have a little bit of, I don't know what it is. A little bit of like. What's the right word? Animosity? You know, like, I'm not going to buy you a present. You know what I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I bought you a lot of shit already. At least you you're honest. At least you're honest. Well, I could feel it. You know, I could feel that, like, yeah, that yeah. leftover feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah, Inside yeah. of, like, fuck you, get your own present. Like, who cares? <laughs> but, <laughs> but not because I don't, not because I hate her or anything like that. Like I said, we work together. No, I get it. But it, it feels yeah, like yeah, an yeah. extra step to to do that. You know what I mean? Totally. And you know, what, you know what's funny? And then I started thinking more about why do I feel this way? Like, why do I feel like I've... And obviously, you know, you get divorced and all that, and you have to divide up your assets. So that's always the back, the back of your head, like, oh, you get this and I don't. <laughs> yeah, right. But there was, you know, you know what it was. She ruined gift giving for me a long time ago. I was like probably f- seven Father's Days ago, maybe, maybe seven years ago. For Father's Day, she got me a, a gift, and it was fucking nose clippers, like <laughs> like electric nose clippers. <laughs> You know what I'm oh saying? The ones that, God, yes. yeah. And I remember after that, like, all right, you're not gonna get shit. <laughs> that's cool anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I thought about it. And I'm like, oh, that's maybe that's still left over from that. <laughs> that's funny that that. Yeah. Would, but anyway, I got. I her, might appreciate she, I got that right now, dude. I think I, I would know. appreciate that. That's like the evolution, dude. Yeah. It always goes down. Little that. did I know she was just looking into the future. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe really she just needed. knew you were gonna need it one day, yeah. <laughs> or it was a hint. Yeah, or a hint. Like when you give someone one like long wizard, like when you give someone a mint. Hey, would you like a mint? <laughs> Why? Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, I got her. I did end up getting her something. And then we went to my aunt's house and, you know, typical, you know, my family can never do a party that doesn't have at least 30 people. So we're there. There's <laughs> like a million people there and had a really good time. My grandma, my old Sicilian grandma, who's, I want to say, God, how old's my grandma now? 76, 77? And she kind of walks, you know, she, can't, she doesn't walk very well and you know, she doesn't have good mobility and all that stuff. And, but she's adorable. My grandma's so sweet. And she just walks up to Jessica just randomly. And she doesn't speak very good English. And she puts her hand on, on Jessica's shoulder. And she goes, I love you. And oh. Jessica's like, what? She's like, I love you a lot. You're a good girl. She's like, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. She's like hugging my little Sicilian grandma. Uh, so cute. I just want to pick her up and squeeze her. Did you guys do anything for yeah, no, I was at, uh, we spent most of the day um, with Katrina's mom and their family. They they go all out uh, for everything. I've told you guys that before. So, I mean, for sure, Mother's Day, because I mean, that's actually like a national holiday. <laughs> so we we already celebrate, you know, Tuesdays. Not like Columbus or, Day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We already celebrate every holiday with them as it is. But Mother's Day is, is, is cool because it is neat to see the kids all kind of rally together for their mom. So everybody comes over to her house <clears throat> and- Everybody had, and they do a really good job of all the siblings of coordinating uh, stuff before there. Like, so mom doesn't have to do anything. And it was like, a, we did a brunch for her. And so, I mean, we got in there like at, I don't know, nine o'clock in the morning and began preparing all the food and drink and everything. Like, there's mimosas that were served. It was a really fancy brunch that we threw at her house with all of us collectively getting ready for it. So we spent most of the day with her mom and hanging out there and, then every year I've started to make this tradition where I, I send my mom, uh, Justin and Jared's mom, who were like moms to me when I was growing up, those that know my kind of childhood history and stuff like that. A lot of times I was at my best friend's 
house and their parents <clears throat> feeding me or hanging out with me or taking good care of me too. So I look at them like my mother's also. So I have kind of three moms. And so I send all of them, uh, you know, Sherry's berries. So shout out to that company for free. Uh, they, they deliver chocolate strawberries. And so I send it and I write a nice note for each of them individually and have it sent to their mom's houses. So I did that for my mom. And then I called my mom, uh, that morning and just wished her happy mother's day and stuff. And then we spent the rest of the day with Katrina's mom. That was pretty much what I did. Good deal, boys. Mm -hmm. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Out. All right. Our first question is from Nelly Minel. What are some of the best life skills you have learned from your mothers? Oh, oh, okay. Follow up on. Yeah, that. I was gonna say ah. good on on, on topic on there. The Mother's Day thing. <laughs> Gosh, I learned so many things from my mom. Uh, my mom has. My mom is one of the most honest people I've ever met in my entire life. To the point where, you know, the little white lies that you do. You know, like, you know, mom, tell them I'm sick or. You know, little 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 things that your mom will do for you. For my mom wouldn't do that. Like she simply would not lie. So she's got incredible integrity. She's extremely hardworking. Extremely hardworking. I mean, you know, when I was real young, she would stay at home. And then as I got older, she she was a, a teacher. She teaches and works with um, special ed, special ed kids and children with uh, autism. And she would come home and still just do everything for us. But you know, one of the best life skills I ever learned from my mom was how to uh, communicate, how to, how to express myself. So, you know, in my culture, there's a very authoritative style of parenting where, you know, the kids do what the parents say because they said it. There's no explanation. Like, you know, you don't explain. Like, you just do it because I told you. And that's very common in my culture. Like, you just do it. But my mom used to let me argue. So if there was something that I disagreed with, I would start to debate and argue with her. And my dad would get mad and he'd be like, why do you, why do you even let him argue? Just tell him that he has to do it or, or, or else. And she used to argue with him and say, no, I like it when he expresses himself. And so me and her would get into these long debates and discussions about whatever, whether it was, you know, should I, you know, I remember I did band. I was in band when I was in fifth grade. I played the trumpet. Naturally. Yep. And uh, you were in band too, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Except you picked the saxophone, right? Because you're trying to be cool. The trumpet. I am not including you guys in my band. Hey, you know what's funny? At this age now, if I was good at the trumpet, you can't tell me that wouldn't be awesome at a party. Yeah. Play some banda. Totally, some yeah. Banda real music. cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Uh, That's true. Mariachis. So. I convinced my, my mom to buy me the, the trumpet. They're expensive as hell. And I did it in fifth grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade. But by the time I got to seventh grade, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Because I, the main reason was I hated carrying the big-ass box with the trumpet in it. It's like you're wearing a big tag on your head that says, <laughs> kick, kick me. me. Yeah. I'm <laughs> so, uh, We're such bullies. But she, used to, oh, shit. she used to tell me, like, no, you, you convinced me to buy this. Now you're going to keep playing. And so when I got into eighth grade, I remember I sat down with her and I actually, I actually sat her down and said, Ma, do you have 10 minutes? She's like, why? She's like, I'm busy right now. I'm like, sit down. I need to talk with you. And so she used to do this for me. She'd actually take time aside and let me ex express myself. So I sat her down and I had it all planned out, like how I was going to close my mom on not letting me do band anymore. So I said, you know, mom, I said, uh, school <coughs> is very important. And I think right away she knew I was up to something when I said that. <laughs> I said, school's very important. It's important I get good grades. And, and, and I'm going to give you guys a short version because I went on. I said, in order for me to focus on my schoolwork, focus on staying stable in class and paying attention and all these different things, I need to not have too many of these extra stresses in my life. And I really don't like being in the band. And I feel like it's taking away from my ability to – you know, do these. And my mom, mm -hmm. after I said that, mm -hmm. she's, as I'm talking, she's smiling and she says, well, she says, I, I will say this. She goes, you've made a very compelling argument. 
And I'm like, oh, cool. She goes, you're still going to be in the band. So, fuck. So I had to stay in the band for another year. <laughs> but she used to let me do that. She used to let me argue with her, and we'd go back and forth, and I really honed my ability hmm. to communicate. And I swear to God, a large part of my sales ability goes to trying to sell my mom on stuff and her letting me do that. That's cool, yeah. man. That's, yeah, we're, like that. we're very similar in that area, too. That's something that my mom, uh, if I were to give my mom a lot of credit for some of the things that have shaped me into the man I am today... That's definitely a similar trait. We had this ability. We always had this ability to communicate back and forth. Sometimes it probably wasn't the healthiest in our house, but we were allowed to do that. We definitely did not live by the you know no and because I told you so. It's like you know we would we would discuss things like that. But I would say as man the probably the most the most or the best life skills that I learned from my, my mom established uh, values and morals with me at a very young age. And, you know, as a young kid, I probably didn't appreciate it very much. You know, it was like, oh, church again. Oh, we have to do devotion now. Oh, we have to do all, it was, we had to do all these things. And so as a kid, I probably resisted a lot of it. But now as an adult, and I look back uh, and realize that, that, that much of that is my foundation and much of the things that I've applied that have served me so well as I've gotten older are a lot of the values that that she established in us at a very early age. And I just learned to separate the the dogmatic piece to it that m- most people have when they get indoctrined by some religion. And I think that there was a time there where, you know, probably in my late teens to early 20s where I resented it. I was like, ah, oh, about it. And I didn't have the right attitude. And I think once I, I got old enough to realize like how important those values were to, to making me a good human being and people liking me and excelling in life, I think I began to appreciate more of my mom making me kind of go through that as a, as a kid. So if I would say that was probably one of the most valuable things that she ever taught me. Yeah. I think for me, my mom was very, um, I want to say like a a word like tenacious or like she very much like is a go getter and like it's all about action. And uh, if like one thing that I did, I mean, it's we're so much alike that it it was very tough for me to, um, I guess, appreciate a lot of of what my mom was kind of teaching me growing up because we just clashed like all the time because, you know, she's very stubborn, very bullheaded but it was all in my interest, you know, and, and she would fight fights for me all the time. Um, just because she just, she cared so much and she, she puts herself like all in on people. And I think that, um, she does a really good job at just keeping constant communication with people, um, that are valuable to her and also like maintaining this crazy, um, like active lifestyle. So these are, these are things that, um, I've definitely seen, uh, myself sort of picking up on as far as just, just staying active, just being constantly doing stuff. And like she, she accomplishes so many things all the time and and never asks for somebody to, to be there to thank her for it. So, I think that now being older, I'm, I'm realizing like I'm trying more to acknowledge those things, you know, with her. It's crazy how much wisdom people who are older than you have that you don't realize when you're young. And then when you yourself get older and you have kids and you go, oh, shit, man. Like there was so much wisdom that, that they, were, they were presenting to me and I resisted for so long, especially when it comes to parenting. Once you have your own kids – Boy, you have a whole new appreciation for your parent, your parents, right? Yeah, huge appreciation. Yeah. M- the other thing, my mom, my mom was, my mom didn't take any shit from us kids. Mm-hmm. She was also very strong. My and mom was very strong. I got <laughs> one redhead. I got one, uh, one example of that. I was um, in the car with my cousin. I was probably fourteen, so we're sitting in the back, and you know, by the time you're two and fourteen, when you're a boy, right around fourteen years old, is when you think you're, you think you're a badass, right? You're, testosterone's coming up a little bit. You're bigger now. You're like, yeah, whatever. You don't know anything. And you know, I'm tall and whatever now. And you know, you you just think you're, you think you know it all. And so we were in the back of the car. My mom was driving us to the mall and I was just talking back to her. I was just being a shit acting like a teenager. And so my mom says, 
you better apologize. For, I don't remember what I said, but she goes, you better apologize for what you just said. I'm like, I'm not going to apologize. Like, I thought I was being cool next to my cousin. I'm like, I'm not going to apologize. We were on Santa Teresa, okay? Mm-hmm. So which is a, so if you don't, you don't live in San Jose, it's like three or four, a three, three lane road. It's a big road. So we're on there. She says, you, if you don't apologize, I'm going to stop right here in the middle of the road. And I'm like, I said, I dare, literally I said this, I said, I dare you. She pulls the handbrake. <laughs> We're going like 40 miles an hour. She pulls the handbrake. Beep, the car just, it, you know, burns at whatever. It streaks down the road, turns a little bit of sideways. We are in the middle of Santa Teresa. My cousin's holding on to the sides of the, of the chair or the, the, the back seat. And she turns around and she goes, apologize or I'm not moving. And my cousin looks at me and he's like, please, he looks at me. Do yeah, it. He didn't even say it. He mouthed it to me. He's, what he mouthed to me was, please apologize. Yeah. Please, please. And so I'm like, so I like, like under my breath, I'm like, I'm sorry. And she's like, say it like you mean it. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I was whatever, you know? And then she finally takes off and we get to the mall and she drops us off. And my cousin's like, he goes, man, I would never fuck with your mom, dude, because she's crazy, bro. <laughs> I'll never forget that moment right there where she pulled the handbrake in the middle of the road. Oh, man. That was good times. Great it's gangster. Story. All right, our next question is from Dooflash. Dooflash. What up, dog? Hey, Dooflash. <laughs> wow. With the full range of motion mantra ringing in our ears, can you explain the benefits of the Romanian deadlift over the conventional deadlift and why you include it in Maps Black? This is a question you picked, Doug? I did pick this one. Mm. Well, they're two, they're two yeah, different. Two different exercises. Yeah, totally yeah. two different exercises. Yeah, you're yeah. you're putting a, a lot. The focus is different. Yeah, you're putting a lot more focus and emphasis on the hamstrings when you're doing a mm-hmm. Romanian deadlift, and there's so much more going on with the conventional deadlift. I mean, obviously, you're going to get more quad activation because you're going to sit down with the hips more, and then the the back the back lift that you get mm-hmm. from a conventional deadlift in comparison to a stiff legged deadlift. When you do the stiff legged or Romanian deadlift. I mean, most you feel everything in those glutes and the hamstrings when you slide the hips back, but very, very little in the back. Yeah, know? it all revolves around the hip hinging, you know, in that movement in particular. And so that's that's definitely one that takes a little more focus and control. And so it's it's something too. You're not going to load a ton of weight uh, with initially. I mean, uh, in comparison to like your conventional deadlift, where we're trying to get like everything. Now that being said, I I think it's a good place to start people. Like I like sure. to te- I like to teach a Romanian deadlift or a stiff legged deadlift before I teach a conventional deadlift. I think a conventional deadlift is got more moving parts or is t- is tougher for people to do. Especially well, just activating your posterior chain for a lot of people is very tough because a lot of people don't focus on that. And um, to be able to um, get that involved in your conventional deadlift is, is a mm. huge benefit. It, this highlights something interesting. And it, it, the person's obviously, whoever do flash is, great name, by the way, uh, They uh, this highlights that they're confused in terms of what full range of motion looks like. Because I can kind of see what they what they what they mean, although it's inaccurate, right? They they're looking at a conventional deadlift versus a Romanian deadlift, and they're comparing one because it has perhaps a longer a range better of motion. A, a better example of what he is or he or she is trying to say right now would be a rack pull con- compared to like a conventional deadlift. Yeah. So what I was going to say mm. is like, yeah, if you look at a conventional deadlift and you look at a Romanian deadlift, you'll notice that there's a longer range of motion typically with a conventional deadlift than there may be with a Romanian. That doesn't mean that one is full range of motion, the other one is is short range of motion. What it means is, what you need to understand is every exercise has a range of motion potential. And that varies dramatically depending on the individual and their mobility and control. So when we say we want that when we say full range of motion is superior, what we mean is, first off, the full range of motion that the exercise allows for. Um, there are limiting factors many times with the exercise itself. For example, with a Romanian deadlift, you're going to be limited by the floor or by your shins. Even if you took the weight off the bar, you're only going to be able to go down as far as, as, as your body will allow because then you'll hit your shins with the bar. So there's a, there's a potential there. But then there's also a potential that you have within yourself. And when we push full range of motion, it's, it's the fullest range of motion you can achieve with control, stability, and good mobility. <clears throat> And that may be that can be drastically different from person to person. It may be, for example, it, it may be a, a parallel squat for someone, and maybe they go below a parallel squat, things start to break down, they lose mobility, 
and they lose control, in which case that is not their full range of motion. Whereas with someone else, a full squat or a full range of motion squat may be sitting all the way down on the backs of their of their you know their legs because they have good control, good mobility. So the key is to aim for to play within your fullest range of motion, meaning go as far as you can within the rep with good stability, with good control, where you have control of the weight. This is important because I've seen people, for example, I've seen people do dips and they think if they just go down as low as they possibly can, that that's full range of motion, but you can clearly see that they have very little control at the bottom. The elbows flare out or you know things shift. And so they're just going outside of the range of motion. So you want to test that range of motion by pushing up against the the edge of it, of your control, and then little by little, see if you can slowly increase that range of motion by increasing your control over new ranges of motion. That's all we mean. But yeah, it's it's very subjective. Full range of motion is very subjective. I've trained people with injuries whose fullest range of motion would be short range of motion for somebody with fantastic mobility. But in, in terms of these two exercises, they're different. Romanian deadlift is all hip flexion and extension. You're, you're supposed to bend your knees a little bit, but then fix them so they're no longer bending. They're no longer flexing and extending. They're stuck, in, like if they're frozen. Mm-hmm. And then you're just yeah, the bending. The just changes from the femur as yeah. everything drops down. That's it. And you're just bending at the hips. You're maintaining good posture so your spine isn't flexing and extending. So you get into this tall posture, maintain that, and you just bend at the hips right where you're your glutes and your hamstrings attached to, and that's it. Conventional deadlift, your spine still should stay relatively stable, but now you're doing knee flexion and extension. Now we're bending the knees as we come right. down, and we're squatting more as we co- come down and come up. And you know they both have their benefits. One is going to allow more li- more weight to be lifted. Uh, overall, a conventional deadlift is probably more functional, but Romanian deadlifts and the ability to, to hip hinge is extremely important. It's a very important uh you know, movement. It's why I teach it first because I think it's it's one of the challenging things to get people to even be able to deadlift or conventional deadlift correctly is getting them to understand the hip hinge process. Mm-hmm. So, right. you know, floor bridges and then stiff legged deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts are great ways to teach somebody the mechanics of hip hinging and keeping a nice neutral spine. We do because I think it's easier to focus on that versus picking the bar all the way up off the ground for the very first time. Somebody who picks the bar up off the ground the very first time getting them to get in that little sweet spot where they're they're hinging at the hips back and they're making sure their shoulders are over the bar and they're sitting down a little bit deeper, but then they're also keeping everything stiff and tight. There's there's a lot more going on with a conventional mm-hmm. deadlift. So I like to teach like a Romanian or a stiff like a deadlift first just to get the understanding and get them that, that communication between the hip hinging process for their body. Once they get that down, then I then I like to transition into like you should you should feel a stretch in your hamstrings at the bottom of a Romanian deadlift. <clears throat> you shouldn't feel a stretch in your hamstrings in a conventional deadlift unless you're super tight. Like if you're a really really tight person, you may feel a little bit of a stretch in your hamstrings with a conventional deadlift. In which case, I would raise the bar a little bit and, and get outside of that. But with a Romanian deadlift, the goal is to go down until you feel your hamstring stretch with excellent uh, uh, form or at least with excellent posture. So what that means is as you bend over, what's going to happen is your hamstrings are going to reach their end range of motion, and then you're going to want to keep going down, and you're going to start to uh, to bend at the spine, mm-hmm. in which case you know, you're, you're, now the exercise is wrong. Right. If you can maintain that rigidity in your spine, go down as far as your hamstrings will allow you, stretch them, but don't compromise your spine, then come up. Now you're doing that full range of motion. Yeah, you may find you need boxes you know, initially because your range of motion probably needs some work and – Uh, That might be challenging for you or, you know, like if you have 45 plates on there, they're a lot taller Mm -hmm. than say if I'm doing less load, but I have to get lower. That's a lot. That's substantially lower. I think it's important to know, too, that it full range of motion is is extremely important. And I think you should work towards that, but not at not at sacrificing not not at sacrificing good form. So in other words, like if I'm training a client and they don't have the shoulder mobility to let's say, do a, a chest press all the way down for the bar touches their chest. Like ideally, I want them to get there, but that doesn't mean I take them there when I, I know that their body, their form breaks mm-hmm. down before it gets there. So, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm speaking to a trainer, this is where your job is to put in the work to do corrective movements and get them reconnected to that new that new range 
of motion so they can so they can go to full range of motion so when mind pump promotes full range of motion it doesn't mean that we promote you take a client who isn't doing full range of motion or potentially can't do full range and make them do full range of motion oh, that's an injury this is yeah this is why we created prime and prime pro you know we're talking about bundles and stuff this month i mean that this is this is like the trainer bundle or the person who is looking to get to full range of motion if you know that you you don't have the capability in a lot of your joints like most people then prime and prime pro was designed for that is to teach you what movements you should do before you go into your lift so you start to increase right. your range Work of motion on that unloaded right yeah. mm. and think about it this way like if you're going beyond your ability to control a weight you that's no longer full range of motion because the exercise is no longer the exercise anymore in other words if i'm doing a barbell squat and i have good control and stability down to you know where i reach parallel and i've you know heard some other bodybuilder say you got to go ass to the grass and so i'm like oh i'm gonna go all the way down now but when I go below parallel, I have no stability, so I force myself to anyway. Right, your and heels, my, your heels come up, either, your knees yeah, collapse. Yeah, all kinds of stuff is happening. I'm not doing a full range of motion because I'm no longer doing a squat. So, so you need to understand that too. Is as awesome as you think you are by doing a longer range of motion, it's no longer a full range of motion. What you've done is you've gone your full range of motion, and then you've gone beyond it with some other shit that you're doing now. Right, and the rest of the body's compensating. That's it. Next question is from Crescenti. <clears throat> What are some positives for competing in bodybuilding? You guys have talked a lot about the negatives. What are some awesome lessons and take backs from competing? Oh, I love this question. This is a really good question. And I'm glad we we did this because I do feel like sometimes we beat the fuck out of the, the bodybuilding industry and we, we pick on all the competitors. But I'll tell you what, you know, been doing this for 15 years and my level of knowledge or my ability to be a better coach accelerated in the the three years that I was competing 10 times more than anything else between between getting together with these two gentlemen and creating mind pump and bodybuilding nothing has grown me as as a coach and as a fitness leader than those two things so bodybuilding did a fucking ton for me and the the, the crazy part was I knew all the science heading into it but never did I have to apply it at the professional and competitive level, as I did obviously when I was competing at the professional level. And that really made some major connections for me that m made me or gave me the ability to help others on a whole new level that I didn't really understand until I took myself through it. So, um, and I'll give you an example of just one of the many things. Um, I was blown away and fascinated by the fluctuation of water in and out every single day and why that was such a like game changer or a light bulb for me was here I am for the first time ever in my life I am like meticulously tracking everything every ounce of water that goes in my system every gram every calorie every every step I take every calorie I burn every workout I do the volume I do I mean I was tracking everything and so I would start along my journey of getting shredded and I'm tracking all these things. Now, I understand the science behind all of it. So when I decide I'm going to increase my volume, I'm going to reduce my calories or increase my movement, I know my body is going to be responding in the direction that it's supposed to as far as leaning out. But then what would happen sometimes is I would get up in the morning and maybe I wouldn't look better than I did the day before or the scale would say I was up you know, one pound. And it now it didn't freak me out, but I did realize that it, it it made me go what the fuck for a second. And then I realized I realized that oh okay well I did do you know a you know sixteen more ounces of water yesterday, and I did have you know twenty two more grams of carbohydrates. And oh wow, that was enough for me to hold on a little bit more water today than I did the day before. Now it's just water; it's not fat, so I'm actually going. I'm still on pace to go where I need to go. But what a mind fuck that has to be for somebody who doesn't understand the science. Mm -hmm. Like imagine somebody um, and, and at that point, I remember remembering my clients and thinking of all the clients that, you know, I tell them to eat this certain way and work out this way. And they would come back to me the next day frustrated because they don't feel like they're seeing the change they want or they don't see the change in the scale that they want. And so that really made a connection for me that, wow, we really can get detoured by this 
you know, day-to-day fluctuation of water in and out of our system, or maybe even the way we look, if we're retaining a little more stress goes up, I didn't sleep very well. All of a sudden my body holds onto water that day. And so I started to see all these little, these little details day in and day out on the way to getting lean. And it just, it blew my mind. And then it made me a better communicator to people that I was coaching and helping saying, listen, like the, this is what's probably happening with your body. And I could prepare them before it could even, before it even happened. That way, when they saw the scale stay the same, or they even saw the scale go up, they didn't get discouraged or they didn't go do, which I knew a lot of clients did in the past, which is they would see the scale and then they go to the gym and they would, they would power on some cardio or they would restrict more calories that day when I had them right where I wanted them to be. But because the scale or the mirror fucked with them mentally, they changed the plan. I think it's, it's great. It's it's a way that people like they're forced to be hyper aware of all their habits and all of um, wh- whatever they're putting into the body and, and visibly seeing uh, the result of that. And so to to be able to track on that level and check up with yourself continuously, it's going to educate yourself on a whole nother level as far as what your body um, potential could be you know, if you were to instill new habits or new ways of, of eating and training your body towards, you know, a specific goal. So, you know, on that level, it's, it's extreme. It's a sport, which, you know, we've brought up to where like to get to a show, you know, stage sort of presentation, it's going to take like extreme levels of discipline oh, and, it, and dedication. It, it even made me more skeptical about supplements, which I already was very skeptical about as it was heading into competing. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've all taken a, a you know protein powder, a creatine, a branch chain amino acid, a testosterone booster or something like that, and then had like this amazing workout and been like, oh shit, like this stuff fucking works. Like this is... I like this. I felt it. You know, I felt it or I noticed something different. I felt stronger today. Well, what I started to realize when I was so dialed on on my food and my nutrition and my water and all these other things that those 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 little spikes occasionally that happen, 99 percent of the time was connected to the things that I was measuring for the first time in my life and not some, you know, supplement that I was adding in there. And so, you know, I could I could get I could really change the way I felt in a workout, everything from my strength and the way I even looked in the workout by manipulating like carbohydrates, you know, by restricting for a couple of days and then giving myself a surge of carbohydrates. Then I go do a workout and let me tell you, that workout shit on the fucking best stack of supplements I'd ever taken in my life just because I was manipulating the, the carbohydrates like that. And so then I realized like, oh shit, when I hear people talk about like, oh dude, you got to try this supplement. It works so well. Or you got to try this. I'm like, dude, that person probably has no idea that they slept better the day or two before they fed themselves better nutrition that they, than they did the, the last time they did that workout. And then they're building upon that was what probably made mm-hmm. the big difference in their workout but they don't, they don't connect yeah. it to that. I think how you approach bodybuilding uh, can determine whether or not it's a, it's a massive positive or a massive negative. Mm-hmm. There's two things, a couple things of bodybuilding that I really appreciate. Number one is the amount of information that you start to gather and learn and become more aware of. Now, that can be a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, more information, if you have a healthy mindset, can be extremely valuable. If you know how specific macros affect you and specific foods within those macros affect you and when you eat and how much water you include, if you know all these things, you can become more aware and move yourself more towards a healthy eating relationship or it can become obsessive and it can become, it can rule you and run your life and then it becomes unhealthy. Now, the same is true for getting on stage. If you are... If you have a body image issues, going on stage can either empower the hell out of you or it can make those worse. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen people who it's it's done both for. I've seen people who've become incredibly empowered, very shy people or people who are like, would never get in a bathing suit in front of a a lot of people or a bikini in front of a lot of people who go through and compete and do it the right way and go in with a good coach with a good mentality and come out of it and become much more confident with themselves, much more empowered with themselves through that entire process. I also think competing in bodybuilding can teach you uh, 
incredible information about yourself in terms of how to control your body. You know, posing on stage isn't fucking easy. A lot of people think it's silly. Like, oh, you just got to pose. No, it's not like flexing your bicep for your friend. No. It's totally different. You're on a stage. You're wearing a Speedo or a bikini. When you're doing a front double bicep, your biceps are one of a whole bunch of muscles that you're that are being looked at. So it's not just no, the, the, the judges aren't looking at your biceps. They're looking at the whole package. So learning how to control your body, present yourself, and you're not looking at a mirror. So it's different to fle- when I flex in front of a mirror, I can position myself and move in a way that I look good. When I'm posing in front of judges, I can't see what they see. So I have to get a, another level of body awareness through my posing and positioning. And that is also a double-edged sword. It can be extremely positive if I can become more aware of my body, more in touch with my body, and if I have a healthy relationship with it, or I can turn it in the negative and become extremely self-conscious and, you know, super, you know, like I said, super self-conscious with myself and, and, and lower my self-esteem as a result. So like anything that has powerful impacts on you, the, the, the power can be done in either direction. If you go into bodybuilding or competing with a good mindset, you're going to gain so much information on your body, so much more than you would had you not competed in bodybuilding. You're going to gain uh, self-confidence. You're going to empower yourself to be comfortable doing things in front of people and to be comfortable with weight fluctuations because it can also be a positive thing to be okay with being shredded and gaining a little bit of weight afterwards and all that stuff. Or it can definitely be a negative. We talk more about the negatives typically because it's more of a warning. I think the people who have the positive, it's the same, we don't need to say much to It's them, the right? same way I feel about CrossFit. It's the same exact way. I, th- I think bodybuilding is fucking awesome. I think CrossFit is awesome. Do I think it's for a majority of the people? Absolutely not. That's it. They're both sports. Treat it like a sport. Get good at the sport before you even try and compete at the sport. You have no business, in my opinion, getting on a stage if you haven't learned to manipulate your body on your own already. If you haven't learned how to change your macros, change your movement, change your program to drastically change your physique up or down any way you want to go, you don't have any business, in my opinion, being on a stage. Just like I think that you have no business trying to compete at the CrossFit level or do these fucking wads if you haven't learned good mechanics. Like you're talking about you know, Olympic lifts at that that high of a level is one of the greatest expressions of movement, which I think is fucking beautiful and awesome. And I think there are a percentage of people out there that have got solid sound mechanics that have a that should be doing that and can do that. And it's neat to watch. Bodybuilding is the same way too. And the, the I think the reason why we talk negatively about it is just because there's way more people that are doing it that shouldn't be doing it than the other way around. And so it's more like that. I thought it was uh, the most arguably the most incredible experience of my life. I mean, I, I have memories from it now that will be with me forever and moments that were huge for me. I learned so much about myself. It's made me a better coach. So many positive things. But I also believe that I was in the right headspace to do that. That's the key. And you went into it, you went into it with the right mindset. Right. That's it. Yeah. Next up is DH Bodybuilding Life. What are ways to break through plateaus, strength, and size-wise? God, I love these questions mm-hmm. we're at today, dude. So Who picked these? Is this you? I did this mm-hmm. morning when I was pooping at nice 5 a.m. Nice of you. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my scheduled, my scheduled uh, BM. So ways to break through your plateaus and strength and size. Well, e- very simple, very easy. I'm going to give you more specifics, but generally you just got to change things, mm-hmm. okay? Generally, when stuff isn't moving, stuff is stagnant. When your body's not progressing, when your strength's not improving, mobility's not improving, whatever, what you're doing isn't working. So that means you need to do something else. Okay, so that's very general. You know you need to change things. The, the, the easiest ways to change things for strength, we'll start there, is to train in a totally different rep range. That's a very simple, basic Easy way to change things. Well, we just, I mean, we call these acute variables. So any of the acute variables in your programming, whether it's reps, whether it's time of, and whether it's rest, you know, whether it's, um, you know, you go across the board of, of like every little thing you can change as far as the focus being, you know, more endurance based or, you know, more of a max you know, strength and, and powerlifting type of a, a programming approach. There needs to be an alteration of something where you've 
you know, like internally, like, oh, I'm, I just, I'm not drawn to that type of training where you would actually benefit quite substantially if you were able to then uh, go through that process for a couple of weeks and then apply back to. Well, that's you know, the, that's just it. That's the problem. I think what people do is they're in a plateau. It's uncomfortable. Well, let's say, oh, my squat's not going up. So, okay, you know, I heard on Mind Pump, I need to change things up. So today I'm going to do a front squat. And then next week they go right back to a back squat. Yeah. It, whatever you change, stick to it to long enough to where you get good at it. So if you are always in the, you know, five reps or less phase, move it up to 10 to 15 reps, stay there so that you give your body a chance to adapt and get stronger. And it usually takes about between two to five weeks. Mm -hmm. Stay there and then go back to where you were before and then test yourself. You It's not just the one, because I, I remember reading bodybuilding magazines when I was a kid and they would talk about routines to shock your body, like shock your biceps into growth. Into growth. And it was always like one workout, right? It was always yeah, like this yeah, one yeah. crazy ass workout <laughs> and then go back to your regular workout and you're going to notice all these gains. Right. Or stick to that one workout forever. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work that <laughs> right, way. Right, right, right. Pick something different, whether it's a new extra. I did this once for bench press. This is before, you know, I can't p push too hard now because my, sh my, my left shoulder had to have sur surgery years ago, but... Before that, I was always pushing my bench press. And I remember I got stuck at, I think I got stuck at like 320 pounds for a max. And it wasn't going up. And that, you know, for me, for a guy my size, it's pretty good. And so what I did was, is I, I, I got frustrated. It wasn't going up. And I tried everything, you know, shock sets and strip sets and did everything I could. So I stopped benching. And all I did was incline. And I did incline for, I don't know, three, four months. So I stopped benching straight to incline. And then I went back to bench and I added five pounds to my bench press. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit. And I didn't even bench press anymore now. And they're close enough to where there's carryover. And so whatever you change into, stay there so that you start to get good at it. And then when you start to get good at it, then you can switch back out mm -hmm. and see, you know, see what's happening. Yeah. I look at this too, because, you know, from a performance standpoint, there's sticking points and there's these. So if I'm in a lift, like I'm in a bench press and I get to a point where I, I hit a wall, um, there's a few techniques and there's different like approaches, even um, strength athletes apply, you know, whether it's with using different uh, things like chains or, um, you know, use bands or you use like isometric type training where I address that very specific sticking point. So I'm at the bottom of the lift, where's my sticking point is, well, I want to be able to recruit uh, neuromuscularly a louder signal at that particular spot. So that's one of my go-tos as far as if I know like specifics of where in that exercise are, you know, places I need to address, I'm going to stay there and I'm going to, I'm going to drive through that for a few weeks to, to really bump that back up. So I'm going to, I'm going to address this like a bodybuilder since this is, looks like a bodybuilder person is asking this question based off their handle. And the the best way, or in my in my opinion, um, one of the easiest ways that you can break through these plateaus, which I think is necessary if you're competing, uh, that each time you come to the stage, you're supposed to be improving your physique. This was one of the things that I loved about competing was the challenge of this. And I saw a lot of my peers, the only thing I saw them really messing with was intensity or drugs. To do that and I just I saw the opportunity like oh my god like that's sure that's a those are those are variables too but in my opinion volume and frequency are the two easiest ways for you to guarantee you're going to break through a plateau and so I follow kind of like the the fit principle right frequency intensity time and type so those are all the different variables that we can mess with and I would pick one or two body parts that I want to focus on not that you can't bring up your entire physique, but I like to measure like one or two things and see like, okay, how much can I really change this body part? How much can I really develop my shoulders more between this show and the next show? And so I would pick one or two muscle groups. This is also the how MAPS Aesthetic was developed. And I would implement more frequency on that muscle group. And I would also track the volume. So a lot of People I know don't measure and track their volume. One of the easiest ways that you can guarantee to break through a plateau is by doing that because naturally what happens is you kind of, after you've been training for a while, you fall into these routines. Oh, maybe you change your rep range, this or that, but you typically kind of do about the same amount of volume. You feel you can feel it. You hit your workout. It's like, oh, I broke the sweat. I got this much in. It's pretty good. But if you were 
incrementally moving up that volume week over week, you 100% are going to see size change for sure. The problem is most people will have one or two weeks like that where they move up in volume, then they come back a week and then they move and then it all ends up being about averaging out for the month about the same amount of volume they were doing the previous month or two, maybe give or take a tiny bit. So, you know, volume is set sets times reps times weight, and that'll give you a volume. So I would pick a muscle group that I'm trying to develop and let's and let's just use the shoulders for an example. Because it was the first one that I, I put a lot of focus on when we were, I was competing. So what I would do is I would, all the exercises that I do for my shoulders for that week, I would measure, I would I would go, okay, sets times reps times the weight. Uh, let's just say for argument's sake that it was, you know, 10,000 pounds of total volume I did on my shoulders that week. Well, okay, well, next week I'm going to move to 10,200 pounds. And then next week I'm going to move to 10,500 pounds. And then I would move to, by the following month, I would be moving 12,000 pounds of volume on my shoulder shoulders. And the way I would increase that was I would do that through frequency. So I would, you know, maybe I was at that time only doing my shoulders twice a week. Now I'm going to throw in a third day where I touch my shoulders again. And that would be a way for me to increase the amount of total volume that my shoulders were now getting, and then they would respond. And so it really is that easy. I think we just get caught up in all the mundane things and like, oh, trying this workout, trying that workout. Oh, I was at this rep range. Now this rep range, like measure your volume, measure your volume. And to increase the volume, I always recommend increasing first frequency and then mm -hmm. intensity and watch whatever you're trying to focus on blow up. And then we, we didn't even mention nutrition here with this. Uh, you I might, like that's an obvious. Yeah, you might need to switch up your diet a little bit and go into a mini cut or a mini bulk. Um, especially when you come out of a mini cut, you'll notice this little rebound effect where you start to put on muscle. You can even get this from a fast. You know, I, I've, I've experienced this myself where I'll do a 24 hour fast. Then I'll go back to eating my normal food and I get like this rebound effect where my body seems to assimilate more of the food that I'm eating. And I tend to gain a little bit of strength and size but, you know, food, of course, nutrition is, I think, in bodybuilding in particular, if they're going to go anywhere and it's not going to be the drugs that they'll add, it tends to be like, we'll change your diet. You know, we talk a lot about exercise programming because we know just how important that is in getting your body to progress. And although nutrition, although nutrition does play a massive role, um, many times, in my experience, it's the workout that, you know, seems to be the limiting factor. So uh, check this out. You can find all of our own personal Instagram uh, pages on Instagram. We all have Instagram. So I'm Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Just go to Instagram, check us out. Different content that you'll find on our podcast. Slide and different them content, you know Different content than you'll find on our YouTube channel. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.